Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. Today, I'm gonna to be taking you along with me as I get some work done for my startup, Clava. As the school year is approaching, we're ready for our official launch and we're mainly working on some bug fixes and onboarding new clients. So let's get right into the video. It's pretty crazy to look back and see the amount of progress we've made over the last 10 months. We started off with an idea, we iterated, and here we are today, a few months later, with a production-ready application with a solid set of features. It's crazy to see that our MVP alone got over 10,000 page views. And keep in mind, this is with no marketing and no outreach whatsoever. We've only focused on building our minimum viable product so that we can test our software and iterate based on a few early adopters. Now we're ready for the upcoming school year and that number is only going to go up. So I just replied to a few emails from some clients and got to booking some demos. And now I'm reviewing one of my co-founders PRs. The purpose of this PR is to be able to support e-transfers on our platform. One thing that we noticed is that a lot of student clubs like to use e-transfers as a payment method, so we figured it would be really important to have this feature on our platform. And for those wondering, yes, we have been using AI to develop our platform. It's 2025 and I think everybody's on that AI wave. It's been super helpful to help us ship features faster and to understand concepts more quickly. My go-to right now is Claude Code, and I'm currently using it to help me review the PR. As you guys can see, this is the flow for e-transfer tickets. If a ticket is an e-transfer ticket, we don't actually charge a Clava fee. So the user then proceeds to enter their information, and then for the payment, they're prompted with an e-transfer page. So from the club's perspective, when they come to this page, they can go see their email payments and they could see how many transactions are left to confirm. The reason for that is we would rather have someone on our platform who wants to use e-transfers than to not have them on our platform. And our goal is to be friendly for student clubs. So we know they're running on tight budgets. And if we can have them come on our platform, even if we're not directly able to collect a small fee with each ticket sale, we're willing to have that if they're on our platform. A user of the club could then come and just confirm the payment, meaning that they received it. So they could select which email received the payment and then they could confirm the payment. They can see their recent confirmations and see who recently bought tickets and they can monitor their total revenue as well. The user then receives the ticket via their email in a PDF file that they can use to scan when they come to the event. Another thing that I noticed that's really cool about building a startup with my co-founders is that all of our skill sets have increased exponentially ever since we started. And building Clava with my co-founders has allowed us to learn many things beyond the field of software engineering. I'm talking sales, marketing, networking, communication, and a bunch of other things. Having our monthly one-on-ones with our assigned mentor through McGill's Tech Excel program has been really helpful. We've been able to network and meet new people. If you're watching this and you have the chance to build something of your own, regardless of where it goes, even if it flops, or if there's a tiny, tiny chance that it succeeds, do it. I promise you, you will not regret it. All right, so I just got home. I went to the gym, showered and had dinner. And for the rest of the night, I'm gonna do a little bit more testing for the e-transfer feature I was talking about. I just wanted to take the time to say Stripe seriously needs a dark mode for their website. It might not show on camera, but this is so bright since I'm in a dark room right now. They do have their developer workbench available and it's in dark mode, but the rest of their application is very bright, which has become pretty annoying because I've looked around in the settings and I really don't think they have a dark mode. For those curious how Stripe webhooks work locally, basically what you do is you have to create a tunnel. So I use Ngrok and what it does is it forwards your port to a public address that Stripe can then send the request to. 
As you can see here, I'm telling Stripe exactly what endpoint URL it should be sending its webhook to. And then when I run my platform locally on my computer, it will actually hit the webhook file. And then depending on the case, we handle it differently. Our application has grown over time and we've been using Stripe's webhook for more and more things. Like we added merch sales, we always had ticket sales, but then we also use it to track account activity to know, kind of know what stage the user is at in their account creation process if they've set up their Stripe account or not. All right, guys, so it's currently 11.30. I'm going to be calling it a night. I'm going to wind down and head to bed. I just finished doing the QA and I made issues on GitHub for every little bug that I found, and I'm going to continue fixing them tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, guys, so it's currently the next day. Today I have a few bugs to fix and a Stripe task to work on, so let's get right into it. So here's an example of a bug that we were only able to find in our production environment. The way our checkout flow works is that we wait for Stripe to send us a webhook telling us that we received the payment and that's when we actually send the tickets that the user purchased. Now, if someone buys many, many tickets, there is a use case where it takes a longer time for our server to create all the tickets since there's many tickets to be created. And Stripe could actually send us the webhook before all the tickets get created. For this reason, what we were doing is in that case, we scheduled a recall 10 seconds later to the send email function. This way, we would make sure we wait until all the tickets are created and then the user gets all their tickets within one email. So you can see here, I use this set timeout to schedule a 10 second delay for the email call. What we learned while one of our clients was hosting an event is that there were specific cases where users were still not getting their emails. And after investigating and doing a bit of debugging in our production servers, we found out that because we're running serverless functions, the set timeout that we scheduled for 10 seconds later actually never got called. Essentially, we get the webhook call and we run our code. We scheduled it for 10 seconds later, but because we're serverless, the code continues running. And once that specific file is done, the server stops running. So in the specific case where someone orders a lot of tickets, the server would stop running before the send email function gets called. The fix for this was pretty straightforward. Instead of using the set timeout function, I just implemented a for loop, forcing it to go through specific delay times to try to reschedule the email send whenever the user buys many tickets. So we weren't able to catch this bug in our local environments because when you're running something on your computer, it's always running. It never stops running like a serverless function does. So it's actually pretty cool to run into bugs like this that only happen in production because I'm learning things that I literally would have never learned unless if we didn't have actual users using our product. All right, guys, that's it for today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed my little coding vlog. And if you did, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos. I'll see you guys in the next one.